Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for those who can make it today. And to all of us who are joining online, uh, welcome. Just quickly to the people that are here today, um, if you can make sure your phones are turned off so we don't have any random calls or texts throughout the sessions um, or session, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll now quickly hand over to uh, Doug Ferguson, who's the chairman of KPMG uh, New South Wales and the head of international markets <coughs> and an NCP business champion for a few words. Thanks, James, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to have you here as our, as our guest. Um, James, wonderful to have you as our moderator, given your uh, an NCP alumnus of some repute and have now uh, landed a very senior role in, in New South Wales government doing what we hoped you would. Um, so congratulations and uh, it's great to have you involved. Um, my name is Doug Ferguson. I'm the chairman, as, as mentioned, for KPMG here in New South Wales, uh, which means that we look after about six offices, four and a half thousand staff. Um, I also have worked with this amazing team uh, to run our Asia international markets business for the last nine years. And um, uh, we, uh, we're going to be drawing on their talent uh, today to, to talk about what's happening specifically in the <coughs> Chinese, Japanese and Indian corridors with Australia. Uh, more importantly, though, I'm a business champion of the new Colombo plan. I was involved uh, on the reference group um, for a number of years, um, working with Secretary Adamson and ministers. And uh, more, more pertinently, uh, I, I was uh, a, a once a uh, foreign student myself, um, studying in, in Taiwan in the mid-90s. So the NCP is very close to my heart and my mind. It's helped me enormously with my career and I hope it helps all of you with yours. Um, as it's uh, our custom here at KPMG, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is the Asia Symposium, one of the last events in the NCP Momentum Series for 2021. And I'd like to, to thank the, the New, New Colombo Plan Secretariat, uh, Michael, Lisa, and particularly Brian Borgona, uh, for helping us to arrange this. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome Gary Quinlan AO, um, who's one of the nation's most senior uh, foreign affairs and uh, public uh, service diplomats, uh, has just retiring as the, uh, the ambassador to Indonesia and has done an incredibly good job over many decades and it's great to have Gary here with us today from Canberra. Um, we've also got our team, as I mentioned, Helen, Ketchy and Jay, uh, who I'll introduce briefly. Um, but this is a really, um, really great opportunity for us to take stock. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount going on um, in the Indo-Pacific region uh, that is directly impacting Australia. And it's going to be great to hear um, from not only the team that are here, but also online we have Dr. Meriden Varal. Uh, who's, who's smiling and waving. Uh, Meriden uh, runs our geopolitics hub and she's also a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute. <coughs> um, the, the New Colombo Plan has been a, a national project of great significance. Over 40,000 Australians at university age have now completed uh, an international experience and I, and I think it's going to leave a very long-term legacy for our country. And we really need each of you um, to go on with the job. You know, we are, uh, Australia but is, a, is a trading nation that depends on foreign investment. Uh, we are very well positioned within the Indo-Pacific region to leverage the capabilities that each of you bring. Um, uh, but it is complex and we need people that have taken an interest in this from a very young age and have continued to invest in yourselves. So, um, you know, as it gets, um, you know, more and more into the Asian century, uh, we will Hope to see each of your stars rise, and one day you'll be you'll be sitting out here in front as well. Um, I don't want to say too much more than that. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our, our guest speakers. But once again, on behalf of KPMG, uh, thanks to the New Colombo Plan. Uh, thank you very much to each of our uh, guests that are in in the audience today and online. And uh, I hope it's a great session, James. Thank you, Doug. And uh, a big. A warm welcome to our panellists and Meriden as well. Thank you for joining us online. Um, I might start the questions today with you, um, Meriden, while we have you on our sc screen to the right. Um, what do you see as the opportunity for business in Asia and how has that changed from, say, pre-COVID uh, to now? And will it change further in the future? Thanks. Um, thanks very much for having me. And 
apologies that I can't be there in person. I have a slight sniffle, which is not actually close to death in any way, but I can't really go out in public and, until that's cleared up. So um, it's great to see you all here. I've got a bit of an echo, so I'll just also um, try and negotiate that. I want to answer that question, if I can, by looking at some of the major geopolitical themes that are driving change in the region and think about how that's shifting the environment that we're all operating in and Australia um, as one of, of one of the many countries affected by this, where we're seeing national interest objectives and business interests intersecting perhaps more than they have in the last 20 or 30 years. So in, indeed, I think in Australia, our national interests or the definition of national interests are expanding such that business interests can't be separated from them anymore, like the definition, the expanded definition of critical infrastructure that we now have in Australia. It's like our old friend Hugh White often likes to talk about, and we've got two forces. One is our economic well-being and one is our security and strategic interest. And it's fine for us and other countries in the region this is true for as well if those two forces are running in parallel to have, to have one foot on each separate horse. But if those horses are not running in parallel, we find ourselves in an extremely difficult situation. And that's a situation that we're in. Our economic security horse and our national interest horse are no longer just running neatly side by side. Now, why is this? Because of the rapidly changing global and regional geopolitical context that we're in. And I'd like to, as I said, talk about sort of four major themes in order to, to answer this question that's been posed. The first theme or mega trend is structural shifts in the international system. So what we're looking at here is the rising economic power of actors who weren't part of the formation of the post-World War II international order and their desire for more voice and agency in the system. And at the same time, the response of the status quo powers to these emerging voices. Now, in particular, of course, we're talking about the strategic competition between China as it grows more powerful and assertive and the US. There are implications in that strategic competition for Australia and our relationship with China. And the bottom line for that, for our bilateral relationship with China, is that the challenges we're facing are much deeper and broader than Australia just spearheading the investigation into COVID origins as, that's, as the popular narrative holds. Our relationship with China and the challenges that we're facing are so much deeper and so much broader that they're not set to improve anytime soon, not in the short term and not in the medium term. And long term, I'd say that it's unknowable at best. The second theme is rising anger at real and perceived inequality. There's a growing belief around the world among average people, those not in the elite privileged classes, the benefits from globalisation and free trade are being scooped off by the elite and that average working people aren't seeing any improvements in their own well-being and their own livelihoods. And what that's leading to is a mistrust that the status quo way of doing things, that the current regime of elite will ever make things better. So we're seeing a move away from the political centre. We're seeing shifts to the extreme left, the extreme right. We're seeing a growth in identity politics around religious identification, ethnic identification, and that's happening all around the world. For example, in the United States, real wages have been stagnating for about 20 years. And that is very much part of the polarisation that led to Trump coming into power and continuing to underpin Trumpism, despite uh, Biden now being president. Now, this dissatisfaction is very fertile ground for the rise of populism and authoritarian leaders. We see then the erosion of stability domestically because populist leaders and authoritarian leaders alike don't appreciate the institutions and norms of a democratic order so because they, pro they provide checks and balances to power so rule of law freedom of speech freedom of information these kinds of things start to be pulled apart and globally we see an erosion of institutionalism and multilateral norms and the kinds of ideas and um, structures that allow free trade so we can look at the wto over the past few years and how that's been 
challenged. And cooperation for global governance on cross-border threats also starts to erode. Now we have to ask, is this just a Trump phenomenon? We just had a G7, and the first in many years where the leaders have been able to come together and develop a communique and an agreement about what the challenges are and how to address them. But it still remains to be seen whether actions will meet rhetoric and whether or not this is even enough to turn the tide that we're seeing around the world. Is the G7 where the answer for global governance really lies? The third theme is Industrial Revolution 4.0. So this is about tech disruption, cyber. But I think the terminology of Industrial Revolution 4.0 gives a sense of the gravity and the importance of this change. It's not just driverless cars. It's not just fridges that can order your groceries for you when you run out. We're talking about emerging innovation, cutting edge science and technology that have the very real potential to revolutionise government structures, economies, businesses, and life as we know it. It's arguably the kind of change that was comparable, that's comparable to that that was brought about by the steam engine, steam power, or electricity, or computing. There are many different aspects to this. For example, automation and AI, and how they're going to um, affect jobs and employment and what that means for political stability. The growing role of social media in shaping politics and society when it's being used by sophisticated political actors for political ends what the future of warfare and conflict could look like. We're not going to see this kind of physical tanks, boats, boots on the ground, but much more of this grey zone, plausibly deniable conflict and tension. So military power no longer guarantees national security. And tech is not only going to shape how conflict is conducted, but also what states are in conflict about. If data is the new oil, that is, who has data, has wealth and power, and certain minerals are critical to the data, sorry, are critical to the hardware that makes data run. Who has access to these minerals and elements could reshape the geopolitical landscape. Hydrogen also is another resource that could fundamentally redraw the geopolitical map. So these kinds of tech data resource issues really pushing geopolitical dynamism. And developments are moving far faster than governments can keep up. And the last theme is the climate crisis. At the global level, as David Attenborough said to the G7, the climate crisis is an issue of global security. And at business level, as Levi Strauss's head Paul Dillinger said, anyone with a supply chain is going to be affected by climate change, just as important to us as it is to the Pentagon. We're all familiar now with the first order effects like droughts, bushfires, cyclones, floods. We're seeing these happen dream and intense and more often. So the cold snap in France just now after a hyper warm spring, devastated grapes and other crops. And that's been attributed to climate change. But there are also flow on effects and we have to look at these as well in terms of migration, refugees, new diseases, increased frequency of pandemic, political instability. In our own region, the millions of people in Vietnam who rely on the Mekong River for their well-being and their livelihoods are struggling to maintain their livelihoods as the Mekong records lower and lower and lower levels of water each year. And that's because of extended and severe droughts, as well as damming upstream, which is another geopolitical issue coming into play. So what does this mean for the movement of refugees and people within Vietnam across borders for Asian stability and security. We have to think of these flow on effects as well. And of course, COVID has accelerated and exacerbated all of these trends. The way we recover from COVID at national levels and global levels will affect all these trends into the future. So very quickly, the outlook for business in the region, we need to understand that geopolitical logic is increasingly shaping the business environment. And this geopolitical logic is shifting profoundly from the trends that we saw in the 90s and the early 2000s, like openness, globalisation, internationalisation and democratisation. And rather we're moving to an environment which is characterised by suspicion, scepticism, nationalism, protectionism, populism and authoritarianism. 
So it's certainly the case that the time of business as usual, based on an assumption that there is a broadly shared and increasingly convergent economic logic, is really diminishing. So three things in our region to look out for to finish up. Firstly, commitments to decarbonisation and the political will to follow through. So who in our region has committed to what? We know that our three major export markets for coal, Japan, South Korea and China, have all committed to net zero by 2050 or 2060. To what extent are they going to be able to realise that commitment? We're seeing huge political um, demonstrations within China, by which I mean um, indications, that from the very top and from the very centre, they intend to meet these targets. So what does that mean for Australia's trade and investment? It's not only coal, but there are other opportunities, as I said, in, for example, hydrogens, rare earths and critical minerals. But we always have to keep in mind with those as well, the ESG, the economic, uh, sorry, the environmental and social and governance consequences and considerations. The second thing to keep in mind and look out for is domestic political in, um, developments in our region. What are the tendencies of leaders in our region? when it comes to democratic norms and institutions domestically and multilateralism and openness internationally. And the third is, of course, post-COVID recovery and development. Australia has been banking on an increasingly wealthy and stable Asia for our increased and ongoing prosperity. Is this still the trajectory as we look down the barrel of a long COVID, with many countries in our region being extremely hard hit? This has implications for regional stability, and we also need to think about what it means for devel development and poverty re reduction as that slows and regresses. So what do we need to reconsider when we're thinking about Asia and Australia in the short and medium term? I want to just finish up by saying that while this sounds like a fairly dramatic picture, we can think about it as an opportunity and not just as a series of risks. People talk about unpredictable times. It was one of Julie Bishop's favourites. But I would argue that it's not so much unpredictable, but what we're looking at is a shock to our once comfortable assumptions about how the world works and will continue to work. But it's not just chaos. It's a shift. And so understanding why that shift is happening and where it's going can really bring great opportunities for those who are prepared for it. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you for that, Meriden. And, and it's perhaps we'll, we'll stick with the, the themes you talk about here in, in terms of you know, nationalism and, and protectionism and the many challenges that we, we have to, to a long established um, you know, way of life for many of us in the global markets. And I might move to you, Gary, and, and perhaps we'll pivot to a, a, a government perspective on this. Um, given your recent um, posting to Indonesia and, and uh, agreements like ISEPA, free trade agreements, and, and closing of ties with Indonesia. Um, how, how do you see Australia navigating the Asian century from, say, a government to government level and a, and a policy level, and also a government to business level? Okay, uh, thanks, Marilyn. You must have uh, you must have uh, aligned with my uh, email that I sent you last <laughs> night with what I was proposing to say. <laughs> no, no, no. So I agree with everything you said because it's self-evident. It is the world we're facing, the ecosystem. To pick up on your last point about what we're experiencing is a shift. That's absolutely right. So what do we do about a shift? We try and shape it to secure our own interests and make sure the ecosystem which is developing um, is as, I don't want to use the word benign, but is as favourable uh, as it can be to the interests of a country like ourselves. Uh, that may seem fairly self-evident. So what does that then mean? It means as a country, we have to be enormously proactive. We need to know how we think we would like to see the ecosystem and what are the points that we're worried about and what are the points that we can work on. Um, the point, um, Meriden, you make about um, globalisation, reaction to globalisation, uh, competition and all the rest of it, uh, means one thing. It means that the rules we agree to abide by are even more important than they were in the past. But the key is that we agree to abide by because we're not alone in this. Uh, and so we have to work with everybody to refresh those rules, reform those rules. 
And there's quite a lot of activity now, of course, internationally about what do we do about the World Trade Organization, which President Trump, God bless him, uh, did some damage to, but it was already having problems. It needs to be more fit for purpose. World Health Organization is an obvious case because public health is clearly going to be indefinitely as we await the next pandemic. We're not quite sure when it'll happen, maybe sooner than we think. So we have to have public health globally in a much better position. Uh, the International Monetary Fund, that's in need of reform and recognition of uh, the very legitimate interests of countries like China to have a greater influence on something in terms of the quota system and everything else that operates in the IMF. And Australia has been pushing for that since um, the G20 was established in, in 2008 at leaders' level. So those kind of things to refresh and reform the rules we all agree to abide by, but as part of a collective effort. Um, uh, and uh, it's not easy, but that's very much what has to be a particular priority for a country like this. And that means you've got to have coalitions you can work with to do that. Um, and be careful to try and make sure those coalitions don't create a binary position, a situation which actually pushes certain people away. So all of this is, you know, what diplomacy is all about and what have you. To achieve that, uh, and this is why I think meetings like the G7, which has just taken place, are very important. The G7 is not a solution to uh, all the problems we've got, but you do need to shake the tree loose, uh, particularly now that Trump's gone, to sort of see, well, who are the countries who make the same kind of assessments about what's going on in the world and then uh, are prepared to say, now let's work out a bit of a strategy on how we can deal with some of these things. Um, and that's what we're seeing. And I must say, I think President Biden's doing the right thing by shaking that tree and trying to get people to focus more uh, strategically on what those issues are that need, need to, be, to be worked on. Country like Australia, the Asian century, well, as Meredith and you said, we're not quite sure how that's going to play out. Uh, we'll have to see um, what impact COVID-19 has medium term and then longer term uh, on the economies in the Asia Pacific. We simply don't know. But I think it's probably fair enough at the moment to guess, guess, not guess, estimate <laughs> Uh, assess that the fundamental shift we've seen strategically, geopolitically, but geoeconomically and economically to this part of the world, the Indo-Pacific, will continue. The reality is when you look at a world of strategic competition, which is what we've got now, the fulcrum of that strategic competition is this region, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that means an enormous amount to us because we are a significant player in our own terms and regionally within the Indo-Pacific. So what should our response be? In the broader sense, we want a resilient region. That means we have to be resilient as a nation and know what we want and what the points are that we think we can have an impact, a good impact on. But also we want other countries in the region to be resilient. And that means, frankly, we've got, we, Australia, have to do a lot more in terms of operationalising the rhetoric we have about the region. Uh, I think we've got the rhetoric right, you know, about ASEAN, the importance of ASEAN, the centrality of ASEAN, Southeast Asia more broadly, but we don't operationalise it enough. And what does that mean? It means we've got to spend more money. Um, you know, I mean, the Prime Minister made a commitment of half a billion new money, um, uh, half a billion uh, at uh, the ASEAN Australia uh, Summit uh, held last November, and that's great. Uh, some money for the Mekong bit of money on infrastructure, $70 million, $70 million, um, fine. But, uh, and it's good and it'll provide expert advice and everything like that. But we need to do more than that. Uh, public health, obviously we're giving a lot of money in terms of vaccinations. But again, that should only be seen as the first instalment in working to ensure that the ecosystem for public health in our region uh, is so much stronger than it is. So more money has to be spent. It's a simple uh, fact. And if you've got a deficit of 1.6 trillion and you're prepared to work with that, well, fine. Um, you know, maybe we could spend just a little bit more. Very targeted in areas where we have a distinct advantage. And obviously, you know, anything to do with institution building, governance, public policy, because there is an appetite, there is an interest in countries in our region, including Indonesia, about what we 
as a country that has remade itself since the 1980s, fundamentally in those terms, has got to teach others, including because we've made mistakes. I mean, as a young kid, I worked on some of this for eight years in the Hawke and Keating government, you know, as chief of staff on domestic, not diplomatic issues. Uh, nothing to do with me, but I was there and able to see the kind of fundamental changes we made and what we subsequently learnt from them. And there's an appetite in our region and we need to meet that to reinforce their own national resilience um, and the deficits in resilience in these countries. I mean, you know, these people know what's going on in their own country, the elites who run it and everything else, and they're identifying problems and they want help. And we should be the go-to country for all of that because they want us to be. They're aware, if you think just of China, they're aware of the potential difficulties with China, for heaven's sake. They want a new equilibrium, but they want it to be a fair equilibrium, and therefore they want the assistance of resilient people like ourselves, and that's how they see us, um, to be able to work with them on all of those kind of things. Sorry, I've gone on a bit, but um, um, uh, my key point is we've got a lot of the rhetoric right, but we've got to operationalise it. What does it mean? What's the next step? And we've got a whole history of doing a lot of good in the region. But now is the point of a fundamental shift where we need to do so much more mm -hmm. rather than just a bit here, a bit there, and play catch up. We're not just doing that, but we've got to do more. And, and, and the region wants us to. So there's an open door. Um, anyway, sorry, I went on a bit. But, uh, no, I haven't I... touched on business, I don't think. And... Uh, uh, Meriden's points about the intersection now between, you know, activity with business and governments and everything else is a telling one. Obviously, the private sector has a massive role and, and should have and everything else, but it is, it is a difficult intersection in so many ways. Um, if you just look at the, at the threat from um, uh, new technology uh, to business, the digital economy, critical infrastructure, these are all under threat through grey war and all the rest of it, you know, grey conflict. Um, and so the, 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 the kind of symbiosis uh, in a country like this with business in those kind of areas to help protect business, protect itself, uh, at, including offshore, but also domestically, if it means anything, the distinction uh, is going to be so much greater in the future as well. Yeah. And, I, and I think that most business leaders are increasingly aware of that now and, and are at least um, privately, if not publicly, supportive and understanding, but nonetheless need to continue to yeah. to trade and seek investment um, from Asia. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what I was about to ask you, yeah. um, Doug. I think you know both um, Merritt and Gary have have touched on these themes of um, you know finding where Austra Australia has strategic advantage and where it's excelling, and and I guess from a business perspective, I'd like to know more about what you're seeing. Um, you know, where Australian capabilities are really matching with opportunities across the Indo-Pacific. Are there any particular sectors? I mean, we see, you know, right through the federal government, state government levels, a big focus on things like themes like agribusiness, med tech. The federal government just announced tax incentives for med tech. Where are you seeing the, the opportunities matching with our, our capabilities? And will that change? Well, I'm very pleased to have my, uh, my colleagues um, that are going to be talking specifically about China, Japan and India. But but in, in general, I, I think that um, uh, there's a number of areas that are not only important but could be increasingly important for Australian companies to focus in on, um, despite the geopolitical mm. issues that will always continue at the government level. Um, the, the desire for protein and safe, reliable food and also the food safety systems and the cold chain logistics to ensure that food reaches um, consumers safely and, and efficiently um, throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I do think that, that healthcare, you know, the treatment of cancers, the, the treatment of um, dietary-based diseases, uh, aged care, um, that, that, that's another really big area where Australia has very genuine and deep experience. Um, other, other areas, um, around the financing of major infrastructure. We're one of the best people at, at, at looking at ways of, of recirculating capital from old infrastructure that might be sold and privatised to enable funding and the right mix of debt and equity for, for new projects. And I know that that's something in Indonesia uh, that's, that's incredibly attractive uh, to the Jokowi uh, administration. 
So, yeah, so these, these are just three examples, but we've got to play to strengths. Um, we obviously, yeah, we, can, we can export minerals, uh, we can export gas, um, but as I think Meriden's pointed out, you know, there is a change in, in, the, in, the, in the settings of governments as they look towards their 2050 and 2060 goals. So we have to adapt to that mm. as well. Um, that's not going to evaporate overnight, but I also am a huge believer in the importance of um, people-to-people -people exchanges, so making sure that we receive foreign students into our universities who come here, um, learn and experience what the best of Australia has to offer, and for us to send people like you, our, our brightest university students across to Asia, because there is so much that needs to be done um, in terms of just taking some of the, um, the heat out of what we read in the newspapers and distilling it down to people-to-people -to -people interactions. Again, a lot can be achieved and we need to move intergenerationally through uh, from, from Gary's and my generation to, to yours um, by building strength um, and, and warmness in the relationship. Absolutely. And maybe, as you said, let's take a deep dive into the different markets. I'd, I'd like to hear from you, um, Ketchi, about the, the emerging opportunities uh, you know, between Japan and, and Australia, are there, are there trends in trade investment? What, what are you seeing through, through this COVID period and beyond? Thanks, Ricky. This is a good segue from Meriden, Doug and you, Gary. Um, so um, Meriden touched on decarbonisation and hydrogen. So this is the biggest agenda that Japan and Australia have at the moment. So as Meriden said, Japan announced a net carbon zero target at the 2050. But if you think about what happened in the past probably 30, 40 years, so Australia has been a key supplier of energy to Japan. So um, Japan basically got nothing underneath the ground. So they basically import, so basically 90, more than 95% of energy is actually expected, exported from elsewhere. So um, after the, um, this, uh, the bit of issue with the nuclear power station in 2011, so they basically come back to the coal fired power station. So the coal is the main source of electricity uh, in Japan, so it's about 65 to 70%, like Australia. So what are you going to do with this situation? So basically, um, Japan is now focusing really hard on the hydrogen-based solution. Um, so um, at the same time, so Australia has announced um, national hydrogen strategy, I think that was 18 months ago, it's a pretty timely um, strategy announcement, but basically what they're saying is Australia wants to get to um, top three um, hydrogen exporter in the next five to ten years. So it's perfect timing for Japan and Australian um, relationships as well. So basically what the strategy is saying is they would invest quite heavily in technology and then also um, and increase the uh, export capability so uh, they can export hydrogen to key markets such as Japan, Singapore and Korea. So we've been seeing quite a lot of um, jointly um, operating projects between Australia and Japan. So you might have seen large um, brown coal um, hydrogen project in Victoria called Heskus Project. So basically what they've done is the Japanese consortium, Victorian government and an AGL teamed up together to basically come up with a new technology called uh, using uh, carbon capture storage uh, technique to basically extract CO2 out of the brown coal to create hydrogen. So they basically developed the whole supply chain between Australia and Japan. So they established the port, shipment, terminal, everything to basically have a new technology in place. So we are going to see a lot more similar projects like this in the next five years. So that's what I've been really working hard on. Um, in terms of the advantage that you've asked, so Australia has got really strong advantages over the hydrogen, um, especially in this region. So basically, for, so the hydrogen is the two types. I can talk about hydrogen from probably next two hours, but the uh, two types of hydrogen. So in terms of a green hydrogen, which is completely clean energy, uh, so you source um, energy from the renewable. So basically, we have 23 gigawatts uh, new electric, electricity and generation capability coming on, on the market in the next seven years. So we've got very powerful uh, source of hydrogen, uh, sorry, the green hydrogen. And then also the blue hydrogen, which you still use for the gas and coal. Uh, obviously, we've got existing infrastructure, like you know, gas pipelines and you know, electricity you know, connectors and everything that can be used for the hydrogen as well. So I think we are very, very pressed uh, in the hydrogen space for Asia, especially for Japan. So we basically got 50 years of trading energy in the past, um, yeah, basically in the past 50 years. 
um, 70% of um, Japan, the coal Japan uses is actually from Australia, and then 35% of LNG uh, Japan uses is uh, from Australia. So there's a really strong relationship. So that is a big, big advantage for those two countries. Exciting times indeed. And I might, um, I might stick with coal if I can. Um, Helen, most exciting opportunities between Australia and China at this time? It's a challenging relationship. <laughs> it's hard to say at this stage. <laughs> Um, hi, um, good afternoon everyone, Helen Jident. Um, so my role at KPMG is to look after the Chinese investors community. So my job is to look after our Chinese clients here in Australia. Therefore, we've been tracking Chinese investment into Australia consecutively for the last 11 years. Actually, Doug and myself, together with our friends at Sydney University, we produced a signature a thought leadership. It's called Demystifying Chinese Investment in Australia. So in the Google it, download it, it gives you a full view of the Chinese investors' landscape into Australia. But very quickly to summarize it, at the moment, not much happening. Actually, in three weeks' time, we will launch our newest Demystifying report. You will see the the investment number from China in 2020 to Australia in that report. But if you look, compare um, with 2018, uh, the overall trend is going down, the investment from China. It's not just since COVID happened when the two governments start to, you know, not on the proper constructive talk terms. Even before that, two years before that, we saw the investment from China going down. There are lots of reasons behind it. The Chinese investors are trying to rationalize their own investments. There was too much uh, kind of a non-commercially driven, you know, fevers of investment from China. And they now realize, you know, we need to rationalize our investments, you know, more due diligence, more planning, and more accountabilities need to be in place. And then many other reasons. But we kind of know uh, from 2018 Chinese investment <coughs> going down. But if you look at a, a wider um, horizon, um, China and Australia, are two countries that absolutely need each other. Australia needs China for its products and services. China needs Australia for lots of its products and services. So that's why the Chinese are not just buying products and services from, from Australia. They're also investing into the businesses, projects, the, asset, the assets here in Australia to secure the supply. It all started from natural resources, as we know, the oil gas, uh, the, the iron ore project, the coal project. So it you know, all started there. And then some infrastructure project followed, you know, no-brainer. You know, we got a large amount of things you need to ship over to China. So infrastructure is the next step. And from there, around 2011, 2012, Chinese investment into Australia started to diversify. So that's when agriculture started at one stage. And back in 2012, every week I got a call from somewhat agricultural business or property business in China. Hey, I want to invest in dairy business in Australia. Hey, I want to invest into a beef farm projects in Australia. So agriculture became an interested area. Although for some years we say we see one or two major agri investment projects, but most investment into this sector remained fairly small. And from agricultural, we started to, um, when we came to 2014, it's property. 2014, 15, 16, 17 for four consecutive years, property from nowhere jumped to the second highest uh, sector in terms of receiving Chinese investment. And after property, it was healthcare. Healthcare is the vitamins, that's where we said, you know, Swiss, you know, lots of the landmark nature's care, lots of, uh, and also Medicare, even um, there's some cancer treatment clinics were invested by, were acquired by Chinese investors, and that's what the Chinese want. And then after healthcare, increasingly we saw even more diversified, like uh, renewables, uh, like now lots of in um, technology, education services. So the trend, in overall speaking, they are they started from natural resources, you know, but they gradually moved to you know agricultural, healthcare, renewables, properties, and now even more diversified sector. What does it say? It says what China needs from the rest of the world are changing. So I believe, you know, I grew up in China. Um, my early career was in, with Chinese organizations as well. It's all about made in China. In the 90s, or started in the 80s actually, the Chinese government and Chinese people want investment from overseas. So they set up manufacturer JVs in China so they can produce, 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 and export. 
to the rest of the world. That's why China is called the manufacturing center of the world. But from 2014, it really has changed. Why 2014? In China's history, that's the first year China exported more capital than the capital it receives. That means China invested more capital outside of China than the capital flew into China. What does China want to own global operations to supply to the increasing middle classes in China? So I believe the trend is changing from made in China to made for China. And in this process, lots of assets and projects became owned by China. But the goal, if you ask majority of my clients, the reason they invest in Australia, they believe they can create more value to the Australia or any overseas business by bringing their products and services and sell back to the Chinese market. So that's the overall trend we see. Great answer. And I might stick with you for a second because I'd like to explore more about, you know, you, you mentioned some themes about where from here, and I might open up to the broader panel and, and um, Meriden as well. I, I'd like to ask you first, Helen, about, you know, what, what do you see the role of, of relationship building in, in building, uh, whether that be trade or investment, or even for some of the scholars here today, yep. their relationships overseas? Great question, great question. Um, I think it, it's a, you know, the bilateral relationship between the two countries is very complex, but everyone has a role to play. We actually do a survey to Chinese investors every two, three years, and you will see that's consistent theme showing up by the Chinese investors. So they feel Australia media is possibly most, relatively speaking, most hostile towards the Chinese investors, Chinese business, and they felt fo fo followed by the federal government. But by, at the state level, at the business level, at, at the community level, they actually feel they're very welcome and supported by people from that level. And that, that, uh, at the local level also include the universities, the other institutions here in Australia. So they don't see Australia just as one voice, although you know, sometimes the media the report can be heavily focused on one kind of voice. But the Chinese investors here, they know that they look at Australia at different levels. So therefore, you know, people and institutions at every level has a role to play. Um, so uh, that hasn't changed in every hour survey. They, they're feeling towards different uh, areas of Australian institutions. Their supportiveness towards China hasn't changed, very consistent for the, for the last 10 years. And um, what's interesting is um, also, although the Australian-China relationship is currently in a very challenging environment, but the investors we talk to, they, they, they don't think they will last Forever, they definitely don't think it will finish in six months' time, but it will finish. And everyone has a pipeline. They continue to study Australian market. They continue to uh, invest into their network and building their local resources and building their local team. Because the moment the relationships start to turn around, they will be ready to make their investment. So to me, that shows people's view on Australia's attitude towards China is is multi-layered. It's not just one single voice, Australia love China or hate China. They know at different level, you hear different voices. Interesting. And I guess maybe I'll move, I'll move now to you, Jay, who I've kind of left on the end uh, for the important questions. And I, I, I do want to, perhaps if you can start with um, a little bit about the trends that you're seeing, um, you know, just as Kechi and, and Helen have both mentioned the changing dynamics of, of Japanese and, and Chinese trade investment. Are you seeing change in the way that, that um, you know, we are trading with, with India and we, you know, Indian investors are coming here? And, and how much of that is built on, as we, we just touched on, relationships? Thanks, James. Great to be lucky last. <laughs> um, no, no, thanks for the questions. Um, and I think, um, you, know, you know, absolutely we've seen a lot of change, um, particularly over the last five to six years. But good afternoon, everybody. And... Um, uh, it's great to be here. Um, as, as mentioned, my name's Jay Patel. I've been with the firm here in Australia for 20 years. Started out as a tax grad, uh, moved around the tax division through indirect taxes, corporate tax, research and develop, development tax, um, including a secondment to KPMG in India, in uh, uh, Mumbai specifically in 2006. And that was a wonderful experience working with um, clients and our colleagues there. Um, and I guess that was probably the genesis of my, my interactions from a work or career perspective with India. Um, and ever since then, my KPMG world, if you like, cons has consisted of KPMG Australia, 
KPMG India, um, and the broader KPMG International net Network, because a lot of the Indian clients I work with are truly multinational um, organisations. Um, in 2015, Doug asked me to take on my current role, uh, which is to, to head up KPMG Australia's uh, India business practice. So like Helen, um, my, my focus is very much on the, the Indian inbound, um, uh, but, but also Australian outbound uh, trade and investment flows between our two countries um, and the organisations behind those. Um, and, I, and I have to say, um, since 2015, I've been quite fortunate because what we've seen is a steady rise in the bilateral relationship between Australia and India. Um, uh, initially spearheaded by um, you know, numerous um, senior ministerial visits, um, but that led then to the two, uh, to governments on both sides developing quite detailed economic strategies and roadmaps um, to assist businesses in their consideration of the commercial opportunities um, in, in Australia um, and India. Um, over the same period, so since, since 2015, if we, if in, if we look at the, the economic relationship um, in pure economic terms, uh, the two-way trade and investment relationship has grown from 40 billion to 67 billion. Um, so we have, James, seen um, uh, a steady rise um, in, in the bilateral relationship as well as the economic relationship as part of that. Um, now, COVID-19, of course, has had um, a devastating impact on India and and, and, you know, for that reason, there's been an impact on, on, on that rate of growth in the bilateral relationship over the last 12, 12 15 months. But two really positive developments that, that have emerged during this period, which I'd like to share. Um, and one is the really close friendship uh, between Australia and India. Um, and I think that's, that's from prime minister level down to the, to the cricket pitch and, you know, into our communities and societies. And, and probably no more evident um, in, in Australia's really quick response to, to India's um, urgent um, uh, you know, requirements for medical supplies during the most recent, the second wave of, of COVID-19 um, in India. But I think that that act of solidarity and uh, humanitarian support um, really, you know, really does signal a, a, a very strong foundation for, for greater collaboration across the board. Um, and of course, Australia and India, as um, many of the panelists um, have, have, have highlighted today, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more that they can do in the space of COVID-19 research, um, research and development, best practice, but also beyond in the health and uh, life science sciences sectors. Uh, the second key development is uh, really the rise in the voice of the Indian diaspora. Uh, which is um, here in Australia, which is 700,000 plus strong. Um, and, and, and they really play a critical role um, uh, in, 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 in helping to sort of accelerate the, the economic relationship um, between our two countries, given the very strong um, social, cultural and, and business connections and ties that they have back, um, uh, back in India. So um, it's, it's great that They've come to the fore during this period. Um, in my view, um, it's it's really important now that some you know specific programs are developed to um, uh, you know really untap the uh, the potential and the power within the diaspora um, uh, to uh, to help organisations realise those commercial opportunities um, between the two countries. I will just turn to the the economic relationship then um, and and. Talk uh, both about the um, the Australian outbound into India and and, and the reverse in turn. Um, if we look at the Australian outbound, um, just just a couple of overarching comments. I think you know, um, just to set the scene, um, Meriden's touched on the geopolitics of play and what that means in terms of open and free market access, um, and 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 the impact and shift we're seeing um, in in supply chains and and you know you know what. What India means in that um, in that context. Um, secondly, uh, the, the 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 core fundamentals around India um, still hold true, um, and so once once this current COVID situation settles, the expectation is that India will 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 sort of bounce back and you know will experience a um, a, a V-shaped recovery if you like. Um, so India's forecast to grow at something like eight point three percent 
in this current fin financial year, FY22, um, followed by 7.5% in, in, in 23. Um, and the third point is that in the two to three years preceding uh, COVID, um, what, what we did see um, was, a, uh, was a steady but, um, um, you know, a very definite uptick in, in, in interest amongst Indian business, uh, Australian businesses as far as India was concerned. Um, many were in advanced stages of their, their India studies and plans, um, had been visiting in India for that purpose. And so I, I really do believe when, when COVID hit, we were, we were at that inflection point or, or very close to an inflection point. Um, and so um, I'm, you know, with this, with, with these two or three points in mind, I'm, I'm quite confident that, that Australian business will, or is, is very keen to resume its, its India study and you know, business plans as, as soon as that is possible. Um, and the, the 10 sectors that, that are identified in the India economic strategy uh, will still be relevant in, uh, in a post-pandemic uh, India. Um, um, perhaps with some tweaking uh, in terms of the priority of sectors, so to perhaps bring um, sectors like health and infrastructure um, to the top, um, given that um, you know India has some you know some desperate and urgent needs in um, uh, uh, in that regard. Um, important to note that despite the disruption that COVID has caused in India, um, the government there has continued its economic reform agenda, um, particularly around um, attracting foreign direct investment. Um, and, and, and making it an easier place to do business. Um, and uh, so that's, that, that's a dynamic space that Australian businesses need to sort of be mindful of um, and keep watch, watch of. If I, if I think about some of the more recent developments in that space, um, it, in, it, India's redu um, introduced production-linked cash incentives um, to, um, to attract manufacturing um, across a range of sectors. And that's, and that's um, you know, in combination um, to, uh, for India to, you know, to become more self-reliant, but also to position India as a global manufacturing hub. Um, secondly, um, uh, the introduction of, of um, or the establish, establishment rather of India's first international financial services precinct, which is in Gujarat. Um, and and, and that's, that's now open up, opened up to, to foreign participation um, you know, in terms of core, core financial um, services organisations and expertise, but also ancillary service providers like, like professional ser um, services firms. Um, I'll now move to the Indian inbound into Australia. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it comes broadly across five sectors, um, energy, natural resources, pharmaceuticals, uh, information technology, um, a little bit of advanced manufacturing and financial services. Having said that, um, in over the last 12 to 24 months, India's Sterling Wilson Solar has, has just become the largest EPC provider uh, for solar um, renewable projects in Australia. But conscious of time, so I might just focus on um, the Indian IT companies here in Australia because of their, um, their presence here, the size of their presence and um, the size of their workforces. Um, they're well established in this market. They're profitable, growing organically, inorganically. Um, in fact, I can probably think of four acquisitions that have happened just in the last 12 months, um, in a ranging from 50 to $250 million in this market. Um, and they're, they're increasingly moving up the value chain um, into niche and you know, high tech areas. But what, what excites me most about um, um, uh, the Indian IT companies is, is, is the potential they have in this market. Um, because the proposition I'd, I'd, I'd put to them is um, the opportunity to, to establish um, innovation hubs or, or centres of excellence and, or, or the like. And, you know, perhaps in collaboration with, with broader industry, government, academia, um, not just for Australia, but also for the region, um, um, addressing, you know, some you know, key national priorities and areas of strategic importance, such as cyber and um, AI and, and, and 5G. Um, and that would be a wonderful thing. We'd see um, them contribute um, even further to job creation, capability, skill development, um, and, and in the higher education space. I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Well, uh, we're nearly out of time, but I'll, I'll perhaps we'll ask one more question uh, and then afterwards we'll do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, get ready. Um, I'd like to, to open up um, to all of, all of the panel a question about, you know, we, we've, we've mentioned a lot of themes today. Meriden, you spoke about a lot of the challenges that we're, you know, and changes that we're, we're, we're having. And, and we, we looked at that from, a, a, I guess, a government policy level um, as well, Gary, and then we sort of moved through the markets and business opportunities. I guess for, for us younger, younger people in the audience, a really cool and, and key takeaway from today would be, would, would be to, to understand where we can take advantage of these opportunities, where we can engage um, in the Indo-Pacific, whether it's in China or Japan or India or even more broadly. Um, so perhaps, Meriden, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you first, as we haven't, we haven't come back to you in a while, but you know, from your, your, I guess, policy and, and geostrategic position, where, where do you see you know, exciting opportunities for young people and, and where can we think out of the box in terms of engagement? I hate going first on these sorts of questions because um, I really like uh, nicking other people's answers and um, then saying them differently and pretending they're mine. But um, I think that, you know, going back to the point that I made about the opportunities here in understanding what's happening, this is where, from my point of view, uh, the rubber hits the road. To understand that to do business now from Australia, you need to build this stuff, this geopolitics into your strategy. You can't pretend that it's not there. Um, and so then when you're looking for whatever opportunity it is, thinking about what, what my colleagues have just said, whatever opportunity it is that you're thinking about to build the geopolitical um, challenges and opportunities into that is really critical. But I also um, want to add that in terms of sort of exciting potential, what Helen mentioned a minute ago um, in response to your question about um, connections and relationships is so true. And this is where, you know, you guys and your experience in the new Colombo plan can really start to, to um, leverage your experiences. When I was working in China, I was um, working for the United Nations over there, and the contact that we had in the Ministry of Commerce had done a master's degree at New South Wales Uni. And the, the ability for us to connect in a way that no one else on our team from the UK, from Germany, from America could connect because of his experience in Sydney, you know, we talked about, you know, going for walks under fig trees and various beaches that he'd been to and all these sorts of things. And the ability that that gave us to work together in a way that, that it seems, you know, it seems overkill to suggest that that really was the foundation for our success, but it really was. And because we had that connection, our project went better than I'm sure it would have otherwise. So I just think that that combination of understanding the, the large, but also utilising those individual human connections as a combination is really powerful. Um, I'll stop there. Great answer. And, um, and Gary, do you, from, from your, you know, diverse experience across a range of different countries, environments and institutions. What it, do you have anything else to add on that point? Look, uh, I, I, look it's, it's fairly self-evident that if you've got that as an advantage, then good, but you need to leverage it, of course, and use it. But, um, and that's what the New Colombo Plan and everything else is about. Um, the trick with the New Colombo Plan, of course, is if we could just get people to spend, once the borders are open again, <laughs> We can get people to spend uh, more than just a few weeks, you know. I mean, it's a, at least a semester and then we should be looking to a longer period of engagement. And, 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 and so many people here today, of course, have been fellows and scholars and that's, that's fantastic uh, and all the rest. My only comment would be digital because we, um, look, we're all moving to a digital economy and COVID, one of the interesting, as you know, um, effects of COVID-19 has been to accelerate very significantly um, digital growth across most economies. And certainly in our own region, um, even in Indonesia, very significant increase in digital interactions for business and commerce. And of course, uh, that cuts into every other business sector. So anything that where we can leverage off digital change in other areas, whether it's agribusiness, medicine, whatever, uh, is going to be a new and very prospective area. And my own experience of young people 
in Indonesia, and I wouldn't overstate that, but, you know, quite a lot, because our real focus as an embassy uh, and so on was very much on younger generations in every sense, the future leaders and the people leading change in Indonesia at an accelerated pace. Uh, so savvy, so smart, so switched on, um, and just huge appetite to engage with others in those areas. Mind you, we compete. They have an absence of uh, you know, data experts, the same as we do. And so we're competing with each other in some of those areas. But increasingly, the focus is, well, what can we do together? Mm. Uh, address the same gaps together, because it magnifies the impact, obviously, in the opportunity. So anyway, that's the only comment I would make. Yeah. Great answer. And perhaps in the interest of time, I will allow the other panellists, maybe we can touch on that in our networking afterwards. So we'll now move to a, a quick Q&A with the audience. Are there any questions here anyone has about what we've spoken about today or anything else for that matter? I have a question that's largely open to the panel. Uh, obviously, uh, the key theme of this <coughs> is in regards to the climate crisis. Uh, so there's going to be you know, two parts of this question that will kind of intersect with half the panel, so geopolitics and business side of things. Uh, obviously, we've seen huge opposition from businesses, particularly in fossil fuels and extraction manufacturing, uh, that have seen large oppositions and acquisitions of hydrogen-based projects as early as the early 2000s in order to suppress them to keep the, the advantage of fossil fuels. What role do states have in kind of aligning the incentives with these kinds of big fossil fuel extractors to pivot into green energy uh, areas like, uh, you know, green tech as well as hydrogen extraction? Just before uh, I answer, can we get, just before people ask questions, can you just say your name and, oh, and where absolutely. you're going to? Sure. Uh, I'm Liam Holt. I'm the New, New Club Oak Plan uh, Nepal Fellow for Thanks, Liam. Big question to the panel. Yeah, I'm looking to the screen, to be honest. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> well, I'm just going to have a cup of tea. <laughs> um, can I turn the question around a little bit um, and say that while that you're right in some, in saying, you know, that, that business has in many ways, in many aspects, dug its heels in and tried to um, maximise its advantage in things that maybe are not so tremendous for um, the climate crisis into the future. What we're seeing now is businesses increasingly becoming very responsive and in some ways leading governments in areas where governments are resistant um, and unwilling to make changes. We're seeing businesses take the lead. And I was very uh, heartened to see, for example, just recently what happened with Chevron and Exxon over in the US, where their shareholders and their stakeholders basically said, we're not, we're not going in this direction, in the climate denialism direction anymore. We'll be going in, in an entirely new direction. Uh, and and we, we're seeing a big shift there. So it's interesting to me to see that many businesses are finding that consumer sentiment is pushing them and driving them into taking an entirely new direction. Um, from something, it's almost 180 degrees, 180 degrees in some cases from where they were a couple of years ago. So that is not answering a question about what role states have in making businesses do things differently. I think in many cases, businesses are leading states, uh, for example, this country. Um, but we're also seeing that this, you know, the consumer sentiment is starting to grow, it's becoming really loud and is becoming really powerful and that's driving businesses. So just a slight shift on the answer. Um, I hope that will do for now. Wonderful. Gary, I, I hate to throw you no, on here. Look, I'll be very brief. The only comment, Meriden's comment uh, triggers with me is we're all familiar with the sustainable development goals, right? Okay. Um, and they replaced the millennial goals, you know, from uh, a decade and a half ago and a tremendously complicated <laughs> negotiation, tremendously complicated um, piece of work, but a very good piece of work. And what I want to point out is it not only for governments and what policy should be for governments on sustainability, but the interesting thing is businesses who are actually taking the SDGs, the goals, and writing them into their forward strategic planning, accepting those as the boundaries for the planet within and the ecosystem within which they're going to work. And, and, and a good number um, of the major companies and multinationals in the world, also domestic, but um, have taken the SDGs on that basis. Now, this is a really uh, a creative shift, frankly. Yeah. 
Thank you for that, Gary. Any other questions from the floor? So I have a small question um, to the wider panel, and maybe Meredith as well, because it touches on something that you previously talked about, which was one of the themes on tech destruction. And uh, I really like how you talked about the effect of AI, because it's one of my interests as well. And um, I actually wanted to know more what our digital policy is in this site in effective implementation and close interaction with uh, public, especially with business and government, um, because countries like Taiwan have um, kind of merged that type of gap or like information gap on effective policy and listening to the people and getting a closer look into the social movement. Uh, do you see that as a foreseeable um, event in the future where a digital policy would be accessible to public? I think this question was aimed for at you, Meriden. Did you did you get that? Um, <laughs> these are too hard. <laughs> these two questions, these people are too clever. Um, I didn't entirely catch it, so I was just trying to write that down. So, whether or not digital policy might be accessible to the public? Uh, yeah, can can, we, can I just get a quick summary of the question? Sorry. Sorry. I didn't I'll, quite I'll, follow. Yeah. Sorry. I'll rephrase. Uh, do you think? Um, it's Australia's government um, or Australian government would be able to implement digital policy and make that accessible to um, small like interaction with small business owners and um, general public to get an idea of today's social movement. So are you talking about kind of accessing consumer sentiment? Um, yeah, on that on that line. Yes. Sure. I mean, this, this might be a good question with that government angle for, for Gary, but um, I'm sure that the Australian government could could do that. Um, there's a lot of tools and capabilities available. Um, KPMG has some for accessing consumer sentiment and understanding where people want to take things, if, if that's what you mean. Um, and the ability is there. Um, and I, I would imagine that government is is using it, businesses certainly are, to find out what consumers are thinking and to tailor their strategies accordingly. So uh, it's it's certainly possible. Um, and I think from, from a business point of view, it's highly desirable. Um, but I'll, I'll hand over to Gary for from a government point of view. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, obviously businesses, it's a big preoccupation for business because it's the way of the future. So they've got to be totally in control of what's happening on the digital side because they need to be able to leverage um, uh, existing digital platforms but also digital change. So that, that happens. I think, if I understand you, um, I'm not quite sure because I don't quite know what the Taiwanese have done, but you're saying that there is a government policy, or are you saying, a government policy which tries to make... Uh, the average citizen and so on, so much more literate in terms of what digital possibility, what's happening digitally, what the possibilities are, but potentially also the risks. Is that, is that yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, government, I think, is, um, well, individual business policies that both federal government and state governments have got a huge focus on digital opportunity, the way of the future. We all know that. You've got to instrumentalise um, uh, all of that to, you know, achieve better change, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff we understand. It's the risk element, I think, where government is increasingly taking a role to engage with business um, to explain the sort of the risks of cyber activity, interference uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and that's, that, that is a growth industry with government and business, I have to say now, because... Um, there is, we all know, a huge amount of cyber intrusion and all the rest. And people think that's all just a geopolitical thing, and it is, but it's also aimed at getting whatever information can be pulled out of different, um, you know, technology platforms and business platforms in order to get a, a, a technological and economic advantage. Um, I mean, you know, the Russians are very good at this, the Chinese are very good at it. You know, all this business about the theft of industrial property and everything else is, is true. Um, and, and it, it goes beyond just business, of course. In fact, the for Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade gets more cyber intrusions every single day than any other institution in the country. It's interesting. It runs into tens of thousands of, uh, of, of intrusions of various kinds um, uh, every few months. 
So all of that risk, the government is very much focused on that risk. If you want to talk about artificial intelligence, I'm a great believer in Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, um, and I think that's the greatest risk of the human race in the future, but that's another set of issues. <laughs> that's a bit of an overstatement, but not entirely, because there's too much unregulation in that area, and that's where rules are needed. When we talked about rules earlier on and where uh, there is increasingly a focus, I mean, the G7 touched on this the other day, um, but we're playing catch-up uh, on all of that. Yeah. Well, I have a question for you, actually, Doug. Um, we've heard a lot about, you know, the importance of people-to-people um, -people links, mm. um, you know, the, the rapid pace of, of um, technology, Terminator, Infinity. Um, you know, among all of this, you know, Jay, for example, touched on the importance of the diaspora in Australia and, and making those links. What do you see the role of, um, you know, young Australian entrepreneurs in, in building relationships and engaging with the Indo-Pacific? Great question. Um, and I was hoping uh, to be included in the, in the last round of questions as well um, on this, basically the same, the same question. So where, where I think you have a unique opportunity is um, you are studying uh, with foreign students. You know, you have been studying with foreign students. You have relationships uh, with young, probably uh, representatives of very wealthy families, private capital, um, who have got an enormous, their parents have sent them out here and they have enormous plans for them. So you can't achieve anything um, within the Indo-Pacific region on your own. You have to have a partner and you have to have a cohort of colleagues. So I think if you could focus in on, on this, this issue of digital technology, whether it's AI or FinTech or MedTech or EduTech, HealthTech, um, AI, cybersecurity, um, plus matching it with private capital through the relationships that you develop at a young age and grow with, um, and then finally, Gary, I, I can't help but say oh, I think we need to put a disproportionate amount of effort into Indonesia, um, our nearest neighbour, um, and I think that, uh, you know, in terms of picking, picking winners, that would be incredibly uh, well received. You know, their president has been out here twice in, his, um, in, his, in, in, in recent history, at least, as he's been the president. Um, there's, a, there's a deep attraction uh, for, for Australian capital know-how and cross-border um, people-to-people links with Indonesia. And I think, you know, if I was your age, that's, that's where I would be aiming. Um, there, Vietnam, and of course, the diaspora. Um, we're a multicultural co country, and, and I hope that um, we all see each other as, um, first and foremost, Australians. And what worries me a little bit about is, is about when that um, there's, there's division within our society. We can't allow that to happen. We are the, we are the gatekeepers of, of unity in Australia. And uh, I think that by, by doing that in a very genuine way, we will build deeper relationships uh, with people that are um, living here, perhaps not having the easiest of times, and that will, that will stand you in very good stead to grow your careers with, the, with this amazing cohort who will, as I said, go on to do great things. Good answer. A small question. So my name is Stanford. I was a new climate plan scholar in 2018. I was abroad in Singapore, Japan, and South Korea for around two years. Um, so when I was over there, I was really interested in sort of the technology scene. And Doug, you mentioned something about, I guess, venture capital and sort of the private financing of technology ventures. And I'm really passionate about both startups and also R and D. How that's, you know, how the labor, I guess, how you get high technology labor in the first place, which is a tremendous sort of geographical sort of issue of how do we get high level sort of so high tech talent, the different startups across the world. And the other thing is financing, right? And also sort of government financing into R&D and promoting it. I know that China is, for example, one of the largest sort of finances of R&D domestically, also internationally. I just wanted to ask the entire panel sort of, what is your opinion or, you know, you know have a look into the state of affairs with how sort of high technology startups and R&D is done throughout the region and the relationship with Australia? Because obviously we have a lot of, I guess, um, protectionism domestically with these countries, uh, where they keep the talent locally, the capital is local, but actually everyone would benefit if it was more regionalized in general or internationalized. It's not flowing, you know, just to the United States, but also in an APAC sort of way. So just wanted to extend that thought and see what your opinions are. Uh, maybe I'll start, yeah. Um, from the China perspective, I definitely see that 
as an area, we increasingly see more and more interest of investors from China looking for good technologies in Australia, the R&Ds, you know, early stage technologies, you know, fintechs, and they want to invest into this technology. Again, their goal is to, um, you know, further develop this technology, make it tailored and bring that back to China. I think what they know that there's lots of good ideas, creative new technologies outside of China, but the best way, the best market to apply this technology is actually in China. So we, we definitely see lots of interest making queries in the fintech space as well. You know, lots of the digital banking, lots of fintech and other creative technologies. And um, I got, we got investors even trying to find a technology. It's like a, you just need to give them like a little dip into your mouth and then they can tell in the next five years what kind of disease you may have. You know, China is crazy about this kind of, uh, you know, if you have anything like this, we'll be very keen to invest. So there's definitely interest, but because they are early stage, not large scale commercialized technology. So the investment is fairly small, so usually not be noticed. And also the investors are mostly private business from China or could be a fund or could be consortium from China, you know, making a 15%, 30%. So this kind of activity usually below the radar, you wouldn't see much reported in the media. It's usually the headline stories, you know, someone acquired a port in Australia or a big, big um, industrial project may get it reported. But there are lots happening in the technology space. And lots of our clients, even the, uh, for instance, um, there's one uh, major investor from China. They actually, um, 90% of their business in China is around agricultural. But what they're looking for now is new technologies, AI-related technologies, and digital banking, you know, fintech technologies. They said, you know, anything we're very interested to have a look in that space. So we definitely see interest there. It's just we're yet to say, yet to see some large scale kind of a headline type of project. I know the, um, the, the last federal budget had a, had a specific call out to, to the financing um, and the exploration and the growth of, of certain technologies. Um, and, and the federal government's also very keen and publicly trying to attract um, the leading technologists, not just from Silicon Valley, but also from Asia, where frankly, um, China, you know, Singapore, Japan, that they lead the way. And if we can attract those people uh, to bring their capital, their ideas and their families. Yeah, Australia is a very attractive place uh, at the moment, uh, once the borders open. So we do have the ability, if we, if we execute, if we execute, that's what I think your point as well, um, to, to, to attract and, and reposition Australia's whole economy um, gradually. Okay, we've got to play to strength. We, 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 we produce the highest quality iron ore and the highest quality coking coal, um, the cleanest burning. So that will be something that, that gradually phases out over time. But if we can balance that with the growth of, of attracting technology and growing it in Australia, um, perfect. We're in the same time zone. It's, a, it's an easy win for Australia. Just to Doug's point, I think um, <laughs> immigration policy and programs like the, the Global Talent Program, which is a new um, program focused on um, highly skilled um, professions um, and technology and subsectors within that are, are, are part of the, you know the target um, to to attract that sort of um, you know capital and know-how into Australia. Um, the, the other thing I'd mention is that the, you know the Indian and I touched on this you know when I spoke earlier, but the Indian tech companies um, tr traditionally have sort of um, you know um, delivered here in Australia as, as well as around the world based on an on onshore offshore model. So, you know, basically housing, you know, the, the, the core capability in India and then sort of, you know, delivering through, through small teams in, um, in, on the ground. But they've made a conscious move to actually, you know, have um, a greater footprint in country. Um, and so what comes with that is greater capability, skill development within the local market. And, you know, we, we have seen that in Australia. Um, so I think they're doing that a little bit as well. One of the problems is shifting the perception of Australia, of course, uh, by people, uh, you know, the business people and everybody else, and even governments, um, um, in the region, our region, for example, about what we are capable of. And that does require a very dedicated program and extensive program to, um, to showcase what we've done in the technology area. Uh, there was a report published, was it earlier this year? I think it was. 
um, by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. It does a regular report of elite uh, views about different countries and what, what benefit they are to you. And this is Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is an elite business group and a bit of government and all the rest of it. And who are the people uh, that, who were poll- you know, the, the responses were, the, the, the countries, the areas in which we are most interested yeah, you know, this is the elite in Southeast Asia because what they can deliver, and they're thinking economically, technology, and so on, not the politics, forget the politics, EU and Japan. Right up there with the percentages saying, yep, it's the EU, it's the Europeans and the Japanese. Right up there, you know, 40%, 43% of people said, they're, you know, for the EU and Japan was kind of, you know, almost 38% or something. Australia was um, way down the bottom. Uh, and I think it was about 3 or 4% or something. I mean, it was, you know, um, just as a graphic of uh, elite assessments of people who are doing stuff and are thinking about what are the technology connections, the economic connections that can deliver stuff to us, to them, uh, and we're just not on the radar. Uh, I mean, I they're individual the, cases. I think the Australian diaspora overseas probably play, play very strongly. Yeah, mm. they, they do very well, but, yeah, it's a shift in perception. Very hard, but you've got to do it. (laughs) Well, on that note, we're nearly out of time, but perhaps since we've taken a look through time today at at what now, um, I might ask all the panellists just for a few words on what's next. So can I start with you, Jay? What's what's next for Australia's position in the Indo-Pacific? I think from my perspective, um, the border's open, James. And um, if I think about India and the Australian-India bilateral relationship, for Australia at least, India is a place, you know, you need to touch and feel and smell. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, heavy on relationships. Um, so actually being able to be on the ground there, spend the time, develop those relationships, um, navigate what you need to navigate to meet your objective. Very nice. Kechi? Um, okay, so um, in terms of the Japanese investment um, to to Australia, I guess that will continue. So if you look at what happened in the past 10 years, there's been quite a lot of high profile um, m and activity. You can see a BRI on, you know, 90% of beer drinking in Australia is actually Japanese zone. Um, but yeah, that's going to continue um, because unlike Australia, so Japan's domestic economy is shrinking. So basically in a net basis, um, the population is decreased by 500,000 each year. That's really because, you know, aging population or the migration policies of the domestic um, economy is um, shrinking. So they really need to go overseas to grow their business in order to survive because, you know, they stay domestically, they're not going to survive. So Australia is definitely a um, favourite place to be um, given this, you know, 50 years of, you know, very, very strong trade and investment prospect uh, relationship. So, yeah, this is definitely going to continue to flourish. And Helen? From China perspective, I think we're definitely moving away from the mega investment project by the state-owned enterprises to private investors from China, as well as the local Chinese Australian entrepreneurs. I didn't have a chance to mention yet, so Doug and myself, we, we just did another area of studying Chinese business community in Australia. These are surprisingly, these are Chinese students who came to study in Australia in the 90s, in the early 2000s. And they stayed in Australia and set up their own business and became very successful entrepreneurs in this country. And what they do, they help to sell Australian products and services to the Chinese market. So to me, from you know, state-owned, moving to private investors and private entrepreneurs in Australia is definitely a trend. And Meredith, I might jump over to you. Sure. Um, so I think... Um, What's next for Australia's position in the Indo-Pacific? I liked the way that Gary described um, when we're looking at this region as um, a fulcrum in the geostrategic competition um, between China and the US or or the way that the world's dividing. And Australia's position in the Indo-Pacific, our ongoing well-being and our ongoing economic success depends on managing this our position in relationship to this bifurcation very, very carefully. And we can't do that by ourselves. We cannot just be alone in in trying to navigate these complexities. We need our neighbours and we need our region. And to do that, I think 
we could do a better job of listen, when we talk about engagement, genuine engagement, listening with real respect and real humility to our neighbours' experiences and our neighbours' um, knowledge of how to navigate difficult geopolitical challenges. And so we don't just um, rely on neighbourly rhetoric, talking a big game, but not putting both our money and our actions into that as well. And I've really heard a lot from um, um, Southeast Asian counterparts in the past talking about how Australia likes to tell them how they should manage this, how they should manage the geostrategic competition, how they should manage their challenges with China. And I think we could do a lot to, to listen um, and learn as well, because we're going to need to work together to manage these challenges. And Gary, on a Southeast Asian note. Oh gosh, now I don't want to give the impression the government is not doing anything. There's not a lot of dedicated policy to the region, there is. But the point is um, to do more because we're at a profound point for the region where we need to do more to be able to influence the way the division, the fault line, is going to evolve and so on. So it's to make ourselves in many ways a sort of um, 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 a really stronger organic part of the region at the operational level, the daily level, all of that. Leave aside the political uh, alignments and all the rest of it, because um, countries are intelligent. They know what they're doing on the political side. They make their own judgments. It's just that they won't talk about them necessarily. Um, uh, a lot of countries in the region, why would you? Uh, but they want options. They need options. But they want options. And I'm talking about the daily stuff to build themselves up as resilient countries, strengthen their ability to be able to cope with this incredible change and the pace and rate of change. And that's where we come into play. Uh, and we can do more. We can do, we're doing a lot, but we need to do more, yeah. And finally, Doug. Well, I just had my uh, second uh, COVID vaccination today. So I think the first thing we're doing next is, is try to vaccinate um, as many people in Australia as we possibly can and then start exporting. Yeah. Uh, we're a generous, we're a wealthy nation. We need to start exporting our, uh, our, our vaccinations to, to the region. Um, uh, and then as, as individuals, as business people, um, we just have to be increasingly aware of the geopolitics and the geoeconomics. Read it, you know, get, get multiple perspectives. I would encourage you to think about joining, you know, Asia Society or Asia Link or other, other groups that enable you to, to get access to information that you wouldn't necessarily just read in the, in the mainstream newspapers um, to continue to understand what, what, what you can, can do to, to build relationships. And, uh, you know, James... I think today's been, been a, great, a great start there in, in terms of um, what's next, but who knows? You know, it's such a dynamic region. So many opportunities, so many things that you didn't think were possible are emerging, and um, I think that, thank goodness, we have such, such great talent coming through our universities to be able to, to capitalise, because you guys in many ways know more about the, the details around the technology and the digital transformation than, than many, many others. So, you know, it's... It's a shared responsibility from here on in. Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to finish today. And, and thanks to all our wonderful panellists for spending so much time. We know you're very busy and we appreciate each and every minute and all of your, your comments and views. So if you could all put your hands together for them. Thanks. And uh, I think on that note, we will leave all of our online uh, compatriots and talk to you later. <laughs>